for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matt Bass. Uh, I'm the executive director at DataSite. Uh, really pleased to be hosting uh, the second webinar um, with um, the various partners in Make Data Count. Uh, this is uh, the second of three, as I mentioned, and really important for us at DataSite in the work that we're doing with the community and various partners, very uh, many of them you'll hear from today, um, and really our approach to building responsible, meaningful uh, research data assessment um, as, as an open uh, community. Um, with that, I will hand over um, for um, a brief introduction and then we'll go into the panel. So over to Daniela. Thanks, Matt. One moment. Great, all right, well, hello everyone. It's, it's fabulous to have you all here. For those who I don't know, <laughs> uh, my name is Daniela Lohenberg and I'm based at California Digital Library at the University of California. Um, and one of my roles, I run the Make Data Count Initiative and I'm thrilled to have you all here. And the amount of people who have signed up for this is a great testament for how important this topic is. And so I wanna give a very brief background of Make Data Count before passing it over some very quick housekeeping as well. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. We are gonna get try and get through as many as we can or chat them. Feel free to use the chat if you wanna introduce yourself or comment, but also as we've seen through all of our Zoom time over the last years, please be mindful of speakers. The chat can be really distracting. Um, and please tweet and follow up if questions aren't answered or if you wanna promote it um, or have you know, more community discussion. So handles are here. So um, if this is your first time with Make Data Count or your 40th, uh, Make Data Count is a scholarly change initiative and we're focused on the development of open research data metrics. We do a few things. So we build and we advocate and as such, we're made up of infrastructure organizations like DataCite, Crossref and California Digital Library. Um, we also contextualize and have a team of bibliometricians studying researcher behavior and data reuse. And then our values, um, as you can see in the teal, are that we're rooted in open, transparent, and responsible approaches to research data metrics, which is at our core. So to clarify again, as this can be a little confusing sometimes, Make Data Count is an overarching initiative um, that many organizations have plugged into. There are standards that we and many of you have developed, like Scholix and the Counter Code of Practice for Research Data, that we build and use as frameworks in the initiative for open data usage and data citation infrastructure. And we see data metrics as a journey. So standards have been set through work done in groups like RDA, FORCE, ESIP, and others. And we have standards and interest in these topics. So we have that community best practice. And right now we're at a pivotal moment where it's required that we focus on broad adoption of standards and on this open infrastructure. And bibliometricians are very eager to work on step three, which is contextualizing. And that's actually why we're having this webinar today. So we're gonna get into a lot of that. But the goal is for us to get to a point of understanding the reach and impact of research data across the disciplines and have responsible assessment and reward metrics for data. And so through our work over the last years, we have found and exposed a few key points that we think are hurdles the community needs to get over for us to get to this point that we're all trying to get to. And that's what this webinar series is based on. And so last webinar, and if you missed it, check it out on YouTube, and I think someone from DataCite can put a link in chat. Um, we focused on advanced ways to forage and use data citations non-traditionally. Um, that was kind of hump one that we've identified. The second is what we're discussing today, and I am thrilled to pass on the mic uh, to another Make Data Count PI, Stephanie Houstein, um, and the rest of the distinguished speakers today who are going to go over this topic. And if you're questioning how is the need for an open classification system related to open data metrics. That's what Stephanie is here to talk about um, and really exposed for us. So Stephanie, over to you. Thank you very much, Daniela uh, and Matt for the introduction and kicking us off. So I'm just going to share my slides here. Um, so I'm here today to give you a little bit of an intro and um, start us off uh, with this amazing panel. I'm super excited to talk to these people today, uh, and I'm sure that you also have, have lots of questions. So 
Um, just as an overview, Daniela just said this, like, why are we talking about open classification when we're coming from a data context, right? So um, within the Make Data Count initiative, um, I have been uh, the PI of the Meaningful Data Counts Research Project over the last two years that is uh, funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And uh, we thought that you know, the goal of this research was actually to generate evidence, um, mixed methods, so uh, quantitative as well as qualitative, on data sharing, re reuse, and citation, with the um, you know final goal of developing uh, evidence-based indicators for the Make Data Count dashboard. And this all comes from the perspective that we think uh, research data should be um, lifted to like a first-class scholarly output, and that metrics can help uh, support researchers to show. Um, you know, that data is being uh, reused and, and has been cited. And you can see here, two years ago, we started with these research questions, and I kind of highlighted um, how important scholarly discipline is for us, because we already knew from um, uh, from really seminal work by, Kath um, by, by Bornman, uh, that you know, different disciplines define differently what data is. Uh, they also use data differently. So we were, um, really set from the beginning that if we want to develop any kind of metrics that make sense, we need to incorporate discipline um, and differentiate between uh, scholarly disciplines and ideally also normalize indicators. So that's kind of where we came from. This is why this was so important to us. And then we started our research uh, using, um, you know, data site as, as our database and kind of then quickly realized, well, we have a problem here because only less than 6% of all the data sets, the 11 million data sets in data set actually have any kind of information about discipline. So um, if you see here, uh, so this is like from last week, I think uh, 11 million data sets in data site 5.7% have discipline information, and we're using OECD here as you know one very general classification system with six larger classes. And you see in this um, tree map how they're distributed. So you know we see lots of, lots of natural sciences, uh, medical uh, and health research, and some social sciences, and then um, you know even even less for the other disciplines. And we also see that formally within the reference list, only 0.9% of these data sets have a citation and even worse, only 0.02% have a discipline and a citation. So um, we have a bit of a problem if we want to create metrics about data citations that are field normalized, which is kind of uh, what got us here today. So um, we're thinking that, yes, we definitely need uh, classification and, and field information about data sets, but actually we need to solve this in the larger context um, of scholarly outputs in general. And you know, if we look at the traditional scholarly publications, there are different um, solutions to this problem. So uh, classification systems um, and field information usually differs by what kind of output type we cover. So obviously, you know, coming from a library world, um, cataloging monographs, it's really important to, to have a discipline. And, and, you, and this is where this all comes from. Um, but often in, in the scholarly communications world, journals and proceedings uh, are really important, but also patents. Um, and uh, another type of scope is usually the discipline. So we have universal classification system. So we all knew, uh, know Dewey. Uh, we have the Library of Congress classification. We also, as I just show you, um, the really general and, and broad OECD fields of science, which basically narrows all academic or scholarly output down to six uh, um, top hierarchy levels. Uh, we also have the Australian, Australia and New Zealand research uh, standard um, classification. We have something like uh, Elsevier's All Science Journal classification. Um, in Montreal, we use the uh, National Science Foundation journal level classification. Leiden has its own, and now also very exciting, Open Alex has its own uh, classification system. Um, so these are usually universal because they're made for databases that cover all fields of science. And that's usually what we're looking for. That's also what we would be looking for uh, to classify data sets. But obviously, there are lots of specialized solutions. So there are so many, I, I can't even list them all. But just as an example, uh, in, in medicine, we have medical subject headings. Or uh, in uh, economics, we have the Journal of Economics uh, classification, for example, that's really important in that field. Um, then not only scope matters, but also level of granularity. So 
um, obviously the question is like, what are we actually classifying? And lots of the more traditional ones are what I'm calling kind of the collection level or the venue of where something is published that's classified. So, you know, most of the traditional ones look at what field is the journal in? And that's where we put all of the articles published in the journal in the same field. Um, of, of course, also conferences or also entire re repositories, right? We know that uh, in the preprint world um, and also for data, uh, it's really, there are lots of like uh, subject specific repositories so we can classify the entire repository into a discipline. Um, but more and more important, uh, I think nowadays is the item level classification. And it's obviously also more accurate and solves issues like multidisciplinary journal, particularly in um, you know, open access mega journals like PLOS One. It doesn't really help to classify the journal. We need something on the smaller, more granular level. So uh, item levels, so classifying articles, but also book chapters or monographs, for example. And then if we look at, you know, how do we actually classify the two broad strokes here are kind of like, well, either we already have an existing system, um, so we just assign our items into the system. So it's kind of top down, usually hierarchical and saying, okay, this thing is biological research. Um, but very interesting also, uh, more and more their derived classification system. So this is the bottom up approach where we're actually looking at all output and then we're starting to cluster them based on a similarity to say, these are similar, so they should be classified together. So that's usually the derived or bottom-up approach. And then the question is, well, who actually does the indexing, right? And traditionally, obviously, this has been intellectual. Uh, the first person to say who what their output is about is usually the author. And you know, we often, most of the uh, automatic ways also like use that kind of metadata, the title of um, an article, of a book, and so on. That usually describes pretty well what the, um, the content is about and it's the author's perspective but obviously we also have professional indexers um, that do that task uh, particular for uh, yeah higher quality indexing and we also have the user so more and more with the social web we had the perspective of people tagging content and thinking showing what they think um, the document is about and we have automatic uh, approaches, which you know make a lot of sense with the mass of information that we're dealing with. So rules-based algorithms, or also more recently machine learning. So this is just to show you. you now I'm a library and information science professor, so this is the very basic stuff of like how do we do intellectual approaches and determining the subject and aboutness is not always straightforward. So it often also represents who says what something is about. Um, so there are these different uh, perspectives and you see the kind of metadata that it's reflected in. The index are usually using controlled vocabulary and the author and especially the reader using just, um, yeah, basically free text. For automatic approaches, um, we have three main approaches and the classic one that I think is most commonly used is what's called document categorization. So it's basically string matching. Um, uh, any form of text, usually the metadata of an item, the title, the abstract, sometimes the full text uh, from the documents to assign them to a controlled vocabulary. So this is a really classic, you know, rules-based approach of saying, if the title contains cancer, this is medical research, right? Um, another approach is the document clustering, where uh, basically based on different similarity uh, levels, and this could be citation relationships, but it could be a co-occurrence of terms. Um, we generate classes and the classification system itself uh, automatically by grouping things that are similar. The really big problem here is the labeling that we're really good in determining that things are similar, but we can't really say what they're about. Um, the problem is also heterogeneity that some clusters might be huge and others might just be smaller um, and the instability. So with a bottom-up system, whenever you add a new item in, your whole system might change. And um, especially with, with you know, publication output over the years, that means every year uh, there's more input, your whole classification system might change. And the third one, which is uh, called text categorization, also uh, this is supervised machine learning, is basically saying we're learning the characteristics of items, of the classes from a training set and trying to apply it to 
uh, you know, the rest <laughs> that we want to classify. The problem here is, especially when we talk about hierarchical classification systems, that the training set, set is often not big enough and it's inadequate and especially sparse. And if you go down all the hierarchies uh, of the classification system. So just to think about this, if we're what we're doing today, exploring um, open classification, uh, obvi the uh, really obvious application here is information retrieval, and it could be for outputs, it could be for collections, it could be for people, uh, you know, finding the right reviewer. Um, obviously, where we're coming from is bibliometrics, so, you know, just determining what is a field is hard. Benchmarking and developing uh, field normalized indicators, it's really essential to know more and, and put something into the context. Uh, obviously, this is also really helpful for improving as existing metadata, for example, having a semi-automated system where you let the user, for example, choose from a classification system. And so from my perspective, what I would love to discuss today is, should we even do this? Should we even move forward and think about an approach to build something open that is applicable to any scholarly output? Should we mirror something like excellent uh, initiatives, like initiatives for open citation, uh, something like an initiative for open subjects? Should we build something like ROAR, like a research sub subject registry? And uh, most importantly also, how could we make the system really inclusive? We obviously don't wanna create another uh, DDC where, you know, we have a very narrow worldview of um, uh, a white man in North America 200 years ago. Uh, we also wanna be inclusive of any types of scholarly outputs of any discipline and also of any language. And how do we actually do this to satisfy so many community needs? One size does definitely not fit all. And maybe the solution is not one system, but a range um, to offer both broad top down and granular bottom up indexes. So this is kind of my little intro and I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie. And it's been great, um, I think, working with you and your team um, from the data side perspective, understanding, you know, working with other open infrastructure partners about what we can do with the community and, and how we um, make this useful um, for, for, for the various implications around research assessment. Um, so I guess uh, continuing on that um, theme, we'll, we'll next hear from Ludo Weltman uh, from Leiden University um, to also talk a bit more about the bibliometrics and research assessment perspective. So over to you, Ludo. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, I want to start actually by uh, congratulating uh, Stephanie and the team on this uh, really uh, fascinating project that they are working on. Um, sounds all uh, very exciting. Um, what I hope to do is in just a few minutes to make a few uh, remarks based on uh, my own experiences with classification, my own experiences and the experiences more broadly of, of, of our team here at the Center for Science and Technology Studies at Leiden University. Um, so we have, I think it's fair to say, we have quite a lot of experience with classification at my center. Over the past few decades, we have actually uh, done a lot of um, scientometric projects in which we have in one way or, or another make, made use of classifications, uh, research projects, also consultancy projects, all kinds of, of projects. So a lot of experience. Um, and something I did myself, for instance, is I made an, uh, an algorithm 10 years ago, an algorithm for bottom-up classification, uh, classifying research outputs, in particular articles based on citation links. Uh, I was actually surprised to see how much uh, uh, how popular that, that that algorithm got over the past past decade. Uh, it, it got a lot of attraction, uh, a lot of attention, to my surprise. Um, but um, we also struggle, and that's actually what I want to emphasize. So we have done this in Leiden for quite a long time now. This this classification in many different ways, a bit along the lines that that Stephanie just uh, explained. Um, but even with all this experience and all these projects that we have done, I feel that we are still struggling and we still have not really found the right way of dealing with the challenge of classification. Um, so what I see is that classification is, of course, an attempt to reduce a very complex and, 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 and messy world to something that seems uh, uh, to have a clear and easy to understand structure. Um, but of course, it's also something that is highly reductionistic, something that in some sense doesn't really do justice to the, the complexity of the, of the real world. Um, also something that requires painful compromises to be made between different objectives that a classification typically needs to satis satisfy. 
so in that sense, classification is a struggle and it, 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 it is still a struggle after having done all these projects and after having uh, uh, built all that experience. Um, quite recently, actually, a PhD student of mine, Philip Purnell, he looked at, for instance, SDG classifications, so classifications of research outputs uh, in terms of uh, uh, the sustainable development goals. And he showed, again, something which I think confirms the, 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 the challenges around classification. He showed the really low level of agreement between all kinds of different um, um, classification approaches for the sustainable development goals, which is quite um, problematic, you could argue, given the importance that the SDGs have nowadays. Um, so it's a struggle. And how to move on? That's, of course, the, the, the big question then. And I want to make a kind of a suggestion and also a suggestion that I think aligns with the topic of today's uh, um, event. Um, so it seems to me, and that's really what I learned over the, over, over the past uh, decade, it seems to me that classifications need to meet two key conditions. I call them transparency and, 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 and democracy. Um, so transparency of a classification means, in my in my uh, terminology, that the classification is open to inspection. So basically, anyone should be able to explore the complex and typically also the messy data that is, that underlies a particular classification. So anyone should be in the position to make their own assessment of the suitability of a classification for a particular purpose. So that's essential. It's kind of unacceptable that we just have a classification and we don't really understand. Uh, what's uh, uh, underlying that classification, how it has been made or how particular data has been classified, that's not acceptable. And second, democracy. Um, so that means that the classification um, or that basically anyone should be able to come up with alternative uh, classifications. So if you have a given classification, anyone should be in a position to question that classification and also to actually try to come up with alternative competing classifications, enabling us as a community to assess the robustness of, uh, of, of conclusions that we draw, robustness with respect to the choice of a classification approach, um, and also allowing all of us to debate the merits of different classification approaches, which I think is, is, is essential. So transparency and democracy are the two conditions that I feel uh, classification should satisfy. Um, and that, of course, means that we need to have classifications that are open. Uh, and that's why I'm really... Uh, uh, well, pleased to see the topic of today's uh, discussion. Uh, so I'm in, definitely in full support of open classification. Um, thank you, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks very much, Ludo. Um, really also some interesting and, and key points there around some of the, I guess, principles of establishing open classification systems that are really important for us to, to keep in mind. Um, so moving on to the next panelist, um, we're going to hear from uh, Christy Holmes from Northwestern to talk a bit more um, from an ontology um, perspective. Um, so over to you, um, Christy. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for making this webinar series possible um, and for creating the opportunity to talk about open classification systems. So I'm going to bring a bit of a biomedical perspective to our conversation to highlight the importance of classification systems. Um, and uh, as many of you might know, I have the great pleasure of both leading evaluation and continuous improvement for the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's, we call it new cats. And I also am the director of Galter Health Sciences Library at Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, yeah, the comments that I'm going to share today, I want to first give a shout out to Karen Gutzman at Galter Library and also to the New Cats evaluation team who lead our efforts in this area. And I'll be talking uh, about uh, topics that reflect conversations that we've had on our team. So our team is interested in the translation of discoveries into improved human health, but to understand this process more fully and in understanding of knowledge translation itself, um, and also tracking how ideas move from basic science to clinical research to clinical implementation, um, all the way to improved health and care of our communities is required. Data sets play a huge role in this space. In biomedical research, like many other disciplines, we see an increasing requirement for a multidisciplinary team. And with that multidisciplinary team come different perspectives, different activities by team members and different outputs, including data, as well as different ways of describing and classifying that research. 
Um, for our team, as we're thinking about understanding knowledge translation and research impact, it's important for us to be able to add context to this space, um, as well as to the different outputs like data, so that we can understand knowledge translation and that knowledge translation activity more carefully. Um, this also gives us an opportunity to more carefully understand and appreciate the role that data play in translating discoveries, as well as to that multidisciplinary team um, and how they help to uh, charge forward in making meaningful outcomes uh, in health for society. So with that, I want to um, pass the um, microphone back to Mike, uh, Matt and look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks so much, Christy. Um, we are going to pass it over to Jason. Take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was asked to do two to four minutes. So I'm going to um, do my best to, to squish a lot of stuff into that um, time. Um, so my name is Jason. I'm from a um, nonprofit called Our Research, and we recently built a tool called Open Alex. It's a comprehensive and open directory of all uh, scholarly products, as well as authors, uh, journals, institutions, and concepts. And concepts we're talking about today. Um, I wanted to you know, thank Stephanie in particular for really breaking down a lot of the concepts uh, behind the concepts. Um, I want to just hit a couple of those um, that were important to us. Um, we really want to emphasize, you know, that we think this should be open. Um, I love Ludo's point that this should be something democratic. I think that clearly can be democratic as long as it's all hidden. So um, we think that uh, extends to um, every part of the process. So the methods and the algorithm. Uh, for how the concepts were assigned. So that's something we've done. So I should mention, we've, we've done this, right? So we've, we've created a, a big list of concepts. We've got about 200 million um, articles. And in those 200 million articles, we've assigned uh, about 65,000 concepts. Each article has like maybe five to 10 uh, concepts. Um, and uh, so I guess instead of saying what I think it should be important, I think I'll just say what we did um, to save a little time. So uh, our methods and our algorithm are all open. So you can run our algorithm and uh, do your own concept tagging uh, on our corpus or on some other corpus. Um, the data set itself is open, so you can download the concepts. You can also download um, the, uh, the, the articles with the concept tags associated with them. Um, there's an API that you can use to query that. Uh, there's no registration or anything that's free. And then uh, in a couple months, there'll be a UI that you can use to click around and sort of explore that. Um, uh, our tag properties uh, uh, to cover real quick is that it is an item level high, um, tagging setup. Um, we think that's much better than journal level for the reason Stephanie uh, mentioned. Uh, it's inclusive, so that means like different articles, like I said, have multiple tags on them. I think again that is um, that reflects kind of the reality of, of the, what concepts are, right? Um, uh, it's hierarchical, so there's uh, six level, uh, five or six levels of hierarchy. Um, starting with the, the root that has uh, nine and then it kind of just explains outwards from that. Um, it's automated and we think that's really important that, um, that that's because you know, we have to tag there's about 50,000 new articles a day. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's really difficult and really expensive to do with, with manual um, catering and it's language agnostic. So uh, the tags themselves um, are entities. Uh, those entities, uh, which I'll mention, which I'll, I'll describe in a minute, um, can be described in any language. Um, and they'll tag articles in any language. So it's possible for me to look at an, an, uh, an article in, you know, let's say Turkish, which I don't read, and I can see the English language tags associated with that. Um, we think that uh, it's really important um, for this to be uh, something that's engaged with the community. So that's why our tags come from Wikidata. And we think that's a really cool place to get them. Um, that's a community that's very large, very active. It's got a lot of really smart people working on it. And instead of us kind of just coming with up the hierarchy, um, uh, we're able to use a lot of, like I said, a lot of smart people having a lot of good discussions because uh, fundamentally, uh, I think tagging or concepts has got to be a community oriented thing. Um, I like to say tagging isn't really metadata, you know, concepts aren't really metadata in the same way that authors or title is. Uh, concepts are more uh, argumentation, right? It's more, uh, I'm making an assertion, I'm making a point. Well, I think this is about history. No, I think it's about geography, right? Um, it's more part of the scholarly conversation than it is the metadata. And so that's why we think it's really important to um, connect this with, with the community. Um, that being said, um, a lot of times, you know, you can spend forever trying to get 100% buy-in from everybody. So that's why we kind of threw something out there right now. This is what we think is a good approach. Um, and we want to hear back from the community. Um, over time, uh, what we'd like to do is allow people to upload their own 
sets of tagging to Open Alex, or even better, uh, they can maybe fork the tags that we've got. So oh, you guys have got about like 80% right, but here's mine that's a little bit better. And then when you're using Open Alex, you could potentially use as kind of a parameter to the API or something like that. You could say, hey, I don't want to use the default concepts. I'm going to use this other set of concepts, this other set of tagging assertions that I like better. And that would be something that you could do. And then potentially which, which set of concepts are better is something that the community could, um, could kind of go back and forth with uh, and something that could sort of emerge. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. All right, so last but not least, do we have Jeff Dillner? He's gonna take it over and cross Jeff. Jeff. Hello. <clears throat> so um, this, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody. People have laid out uh, the issues very nicely. And all that's left for me to do is tell you a tale of woe, uh, which is uh, what we tried to do at Crossref, uh, why it was ultimately stupid how we're trying to fix it in the short term and then how we hope to fix it uh, in the long term. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Builder, uh, Director of Technology and Research. Uh, before uh, this position, I was the head of uh, what we call strategic initiatives, um, which is sort of a labs arm of Crossref. Uh, and we've developed a lot of things that have since become uh, production things. And, and this is sort of the start of a tale of um, exactly why you have to be careful about when you move things from labs uh, to production. Uh, so almost everything uh, and all of the problems and stupidities here are, are ultimately my fault. And that's kind of why I'm trying to fix them. I want to tell yeah. you about, sorry. Can you um, share that? We can see oh. the whole, yeah. Thank oh, you. sorry, yep. sorry, yep. Um, so um, I want to tell you, uh, a little bit about the uh, classification as we've applied it to what is our what we call our REST API. And if you don't know what our REST API is, it's the main API for Crossref. Uh, it allows you to query information about our members, about uh, uh, individual works, FDOIs, uh, about um, funders, about uh, anybody who participates in Crossref. It gets about 500 to 700 million requests a month. Um, so it's pretty popular and it's a source, it's an upstream source for a lot of data that is fueling a lot of other systems uh, that we're talking about here. Um, the REST API started as a Crossref Labs project. Um, and we built it really to, to do something else originally. We built it as uh, sort of a something that we thought might serve as a tool for, as a backend for a tool that would allow people to cite things more easily in blog posts. And, um, and that was its original conception. And then it kind of blew up and we did all sorts of experiments with it. Uh, one of which was to add uh, classification data uh, to, uh, to the metadata records that we have. And we added classification metadata to the records that we had because our members weren't providing this upfront. Um, ideally, we would have liked them to have provided this up front, but they uh, weren't. I don't think we even uh, had a, a space for it in our schema. And so uh, we had lots of people asking if we could apply classification data. So we, we, we conducted an experiment, which is what our job was at the time. Um, and what we did was we got this list of classifications from Elsevier, which you can download from their page, and it maps to ISSNs. And we mapped it to our ISSNs and then started including that metadata in our API. Um, you can go off and you can look at this classification. Uh, it's pretty well documented. Um, but when we applied it, uh, we made a few mistakes. Um, uh, the first, and you can see this here, is that even though the classifications as provided by Elsevier uh, are applied to the journal level, to the container level, at the ISSN level, we um, included this metadata at the works, at the works uh, level. And so this is misleading for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that, of course, um, uh, just because something, you know, uh, we've got a whole bunch of things, for example, that might uh, uh, be published in a mega journal like PLOS One or in a very generalist journal like Nature. And so the classification doesn't necessarily apply to the item in, in that container. Um, so that was the first big mistake uh, that we made. And the, the second big mistake that we made was that we didn't quite realize at the time 
that we were going to have all sorts of problems with overlap or lack thereof. So there are ISSNs that we have in Crossref that don't exist in Scopus, and therefore they did not have a classification for. And then, of course, there are ISSNs in Scopus that were not in Crossref, um, which didn't affect us as much, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's worth noting. Another problem we faced uh, sort of more recently was what we call the ISSN race condition, which was that ISSN decided that uh, as that um, part of getting an ISSN, as part of the process of getting an ISSN, a publication had to have a history of publishing first. And so uh, from our point of view at Crossref, that meant we could no longer use the ISSN um, as a starting point for assigning categories because some of our members, our new members who were just starting journals might not have an ISSN. And so we had to assign them what we call the container level DOI uh, instead. And so we couldn't map those at all. The other problem was that it only applied to serials. Crossref uh, contains a lot more than just serials. We have monographs, we have uh, components, data sets, all sorts of things. Um, as I said, we applied it to the wrong resource. And then this last one is sort of a technical problem, but it's uh, a problem nonetheless, and that is that um, it's not updated accurately. So um, this particularly is a problem because it's cumulative. So if something changes or if something was mislabeled, uh, uh, we don't update that until we re-index the entire database. So the, 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 um, the, the categorizations get out of sync over time until we do a complete re-index of the database. Um, and then finally, the other and last problem was that the, the particular categorization that we used didn't seem to be widely used elsewhere. Um, and so uh, there are a, a whole slew of the way, problems with the way that we implemented categorization in the API. Um, and in the short term, we're trying to fix them in an R&D project. Esha Data, Data is, on the, uh, is, I know, on this call, and she's in the R&D group and is working on this as, as we talk. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill in the gaps. We're trying, to, we're trying to see if we can take the information that we do have and use it as a training set to create an algorithm that allows us to at least tag at the container level uh, the information that doesn't have um, that doesn't have categories at the moment, and uh, we will do this in a. We hope to do this in a across our corpus so that it would apply to everything, um, and of course we'll make this open. And the big goal here is just to fill in the gaps that that I highlighted before. But we know that this is inadequate for a lot of the reasons that lots of people have already pointed out. It's at the container level. It will be uh, derived based on something that, that sort of already exists and is imperfect. Uh, and so we are looking for a longer term solution. And that's why we're interested in this conversation, why we've been talking to Stephanie and others about what we can do in the longer term. I will repeat probably something that lots of other people have said, what we wanna see uh, is something that's cross-discipline that applies to the work level and that's open. And there's one thing that I did not list here, um, and that is that we would like to see it applied as far upstream as possible. And that's not because we think that, that it's necessarily the most accurate place for it to happen, or even the only place where categorization should happen, but we would like to see there be some category assigned to publications as soon as they're registered with a DOI, if for nothing else than to see the conversation and to allow people to identify things that have ostensibly been categorized as this so that they can refine the categories or so that they can apply different categories to them if that's appropriate. Um, so those are the things we'd like to see and that's really our story of woe and, and, and thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate the honesty. Um, <laughs> so bringing everyone back on screen here. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in Q&A, um, but one question that Matt and I had when we were thinking about this topic with Stephanie in general, thinking about you know why is this important for data metrics, make data count. Uh, our first question you all answered, which is great, which was <laughs> uh, what can we not repeat from mistakes in the past and what can we do differently? So it seems like you guys have all really pointed out um, that we needed to be open, cross-discipline, as Jeff says, upstream. And Stephanie went through a lot of the ways of how um, 
And so a question that we want to ask all of you before going to others is, this seems like a lengthy and lofty investment if we're going to create an open classification system, but thinking about um, maybe especially in the context of us trying to contextualize data and understand data metrics, um, what What's the downside if we don't prioritize this big work pretty immediately? So I'd love to hear from each of you to answer that question, um, maybe so that it doesn't get, <laughs> I'll just go with the speaking order. Let's do that. <laughs> so Stephanie, you first. I'm gonna keep it very brief because I already took up a lot of time, but from my very specific position of somebody, you know, working on metrics, I think if we don't create an open classification system, to uh, come up with a good, reliable field normalized citation indicator, then you know all of the efforts of you know what we we have been working on, and especially uh, you know people like Ludo uh, of making the citations open and now the abstract open. Um, if we don't have the context of discipline, uh, then I think there's a really big gap, and it will be really hard to move away from these proprietary infrastructures where we have built up uh this information over decades Amber, oh luda ludo christy jason jeff <laughs> oh, yeah. yes um I, well i think i also made clear why i feel uh, it's really essential to have uh, open classifications i think i should really use plural because of the reasons that i that i explained um, However, there's perhaps one kind of a thing I want to a little bit make, make a warning uh, for. So we, as bibliometricians, scientometricians, we tend to think about classifications indeed as a way, field classification as a way to do, as Stephanie calls it, field normalization. Um, it's also something that has a long history at my center and also in my own work. Um, um, there's also, for instance, the Zobot Leiden Manifesto, in which we make a strong recommendation to do field classification. I, I must say, over, over the years, I have become a little bit more skeptical about that. Um, because, yes, these things need to be normalized in some sense, but at the same time, these normalizations are so sensitive to the choices that you make. And these, these, um, uh, that's kind of hidden behind the numbers. So, so end users are not aware of that. And I struggle with that. I must say, I find it sometimes a bit uneasy to indeed work with these normalized indicators to present them as things that can be compared across fields, while we also know that it all depends very much on which classification you happen to be working with. Um, and it, I don't really have an answer to that, but it's kind of warning I want to make. So let's also be a little bit careful with, uh, with this. Okay, I'll just jump in really quickly to say, uh, you know, especially I've talked a little bit about this biomedical context, but also that it reflects so much more than what's happening on a medical research campus. You know, our teams uh, represent different perspectives from our community um, and beyond, and we aren't able to necessarily understand the context of the work and how it relates to one another. I think there's also some challenges when we're looking across disciplines. Uh, there are synonyms that are used, and it makes it very difficult for us to be able to tease apart what's happening um, in the biomedical context like we see it from there and recognizing actually it's the same thing uh, in a different discipline. So I, I love the idea of um, more open infrastructure always, but I think that this is actually a tool that can be used extensively by many different stakeholders. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in to say, um, I think the other panelists covered pretty well. I, I, I always say that um, I think when it comes to classification uh, and just anything in scholarly metadata, uh, if we in the open world don't get it, um, it's going to be enclosed by those who are going to try and um, make it a commercial enterprise and then charge rent for it. Um, and I think we unfortunately kind of got trapped into that with a lot of the other um, systems that we use in scholarly communication, uh, like you know, citation graphs and stuff like that. And I think that we have a chance to maybe start it on the open foot now and uh, make that the default. And I think that um, people 10, 20 years ago from now could potentially be really thanking us for that. Right, so um, I'm uh, clearly pro open infrastructure. And uh, the only thing I'd point out is that, uh, that uh, you know, everybody benefits from open infrastructure, including um, including <laughs> including closed uh, organizations. Um, and um, 
and I think that that's ultimately the power of open infrastructure. You can get a lot of people to 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 agree to use it um, because it uh, because it doesn't lock them in. Uh, the thing that I didn't say is that one of the reasons that I think it's important that it be open um, is that in order to get it adopted upstream, if, um, we need something that everybody can use without without risk. Um, and, uh, and and so yeah, I think open is important for 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 everybody in the in the in the, in the community. Yeah, some um, really interesting comments, and, and I see a few uh, comments coming through in the chat and both Q&A. Um, I guess uh, Daniela and I had spoken about a bit of this before and continuing on, continuing on this theme. Um, I, I think it would be nice to hear from the panelists briefly. We, you know, we've spoken a bit about what is the risk of not prioritizing this uh, now, but what do you see now as the next step? And I think that would be interesting to hear for the participants as what do we do as, as the next step towards an open classification system um, in, in, in your opinion? Um, and maybe if we just use the same, same order again. Yeah, so um, I, I laid out a little bit the technical problems and I think it's also um, safe to say like what Ludo said in terms of they have such a long experience of trying to classify things, right? Um, and it's hard um, because, you know, like people don't necessarily agree on like, you know, what is a subject? What is something about? Um, it, it also changes over time. Uh, you know, in, in bibliometrics, we also have this like uh, cited site versus citing site normalization, right? Like should something be placed in where it's published or where it's used? Um, but I think in, in general, I would say that the next steps um, are more of a community bringing the right people together rather than focusing too much on like the one technical solution at this point because i think um we'll never create anything perfect i think if you talk about classification this is something you have to accept there is not a one size fits all um so i think more than you know just quickly coming up with a new system it's so much uh, more important to get the right people together that we, uh, you know, ensure reusability uh, and that it applies to a lot of users um, because creating another like silo or, you know, even if it's open, if it's only used or backed up by a very small community, it's also not very helpful. Um, and I also think that uh, we have to have some definitions of what kind of use cases we want to focus on, because from an indicator and metrics point of view, a classification system is something completely different than from, you know, like discoverability uh, or, you know, uh, you know, monitoring or evaluating, uh, evaluating signs. And uh, I just want to say that I'm all for reusing existing systems. <laughs> rather than reinventing the wheel, um, because I think also with the best intentions, you know, it's really hard to um, to come up with with something good and universal. At the same time, we also know that existing systems, if either they're, you know, if they're bottom up or top top down, um, they have problems in terms of like diversity, uh, you know, like even if we say, okay, we're looking at all scholarly literature and clustering things. Well, we already know that feels like humanities and arts aren't well represented in the kind of scholarly outputs we usually look at. So we're excluding those, we're excluding certain languages. Uh, and the same with these traditional systems that we have, like Dewey, right, is famous for uh, uh, basically excluding lots of different uh, diverse points of view. So um, I think for, from my perspective, rather than, you know, we have to find technical solutions, but for me, the most important thing is the community and bringing together diverse points of views to ensure that this is a system that's relevant to many and not just few. Perhaps what I could add to what uh, Stephanie just mentioned is, um, um, well, the thing that you did actually, actually mention, Stephanie, the use case, I think that's probably what, what should come first, thinking really carefully about the key use cases that you want to serve and the different use cases will require different solutions. So that's also why I emphasize the need to kind of talk about this in terms of uh, classifications, plural rather than singular. Um, I also think that um, perhaps there is this issue of different levels of granularity that classifications can have. And I feel that especially when you go to lower levels of granularity, it's hard to have 
anything that resembles a kind of a generic solution. That's that I, I'm a bit skeptical about that. I think at higher levels of granularity, uh, bigger disciplines, um, there is something like that. Uh, there's a need for something like that. So perhaps. Perhaps that's where we should start um, to have a kind of uh, uh, consistency in the way all kinds of scientific statistics are reported in, in policy reports globally to just make sure that these statistics reports can be uh, compared in a, in a better way because they rely on a, on, on a shared classification. Um, so that's, I think, um, probably where I would start. Okay, I'll just jump in. I, I love everything that Stephanie and Ludo said. Um, I will say the making sure that the open classification is representative of diverse perspectives is important, but also understanding the stakeholders who can help with implementation and adoption on a practical level is important. And I think that's a role that libraries do play a great, uh, you know, great role on campus with and can help to advance those conversations in addition to, you know, some of the more uh, specific technical aspects of the discussion. So um, making that an inclusive process is incredibly important. Yeah, and I'll say that my co-panelists, I think, have addressed it really well. Um, I would add, um, you know, one of the things we try and do our research is try and create something that people can talk about. I think it's great to have these discussions, but I think it's also useful to have something that people can look at and say, okay, well, that's wrong or this part's right. So that, <clears throat> that's why we're hoping we're contributing a little bit to discussion and that we do have an operational open system right now. Uh, you can download all the tags, you can download all the articles, you can use API. Uh, you can download the algorithm that we use that does the tagging that's all open source so um, the thing is kind of open soup to nuts and we really want to hear what people kind of have to say based on like said open tagging system of wikidata um, we want to hear what people have to say about that is it good is it bad um, how do they want to change it um, and uh, and we hope that maybe said like that can um, provide maybe uh, some useful examples maybe to add um, to the discussion Yeah, I mean, I'd pick up on that. I think, um, you know, for all of my joking about uh, why what we did was stupid, uh, it was useful to actually get something in front of people uh, to to respond to. And um, I think probably the only my my only real regret is that we hadn't, you know, that we weren't able to respond to it earlier because we had a lot of other stuff to do. But now we're looking at it, and um, and I hope we can do something. As I said, in the short term, that certainly won't be still won't be perfect um, in any by any means and won't address a lot of the issues raised here, but at least we'll, it will make what we have um, or the limited thing we have a little more consistent. Thanks so much everyone for sharing your perspectives on that. Um, I know that all of you who have asked questions are probably upset that we haven't gotten to them <laughs> just because there are too many. So we didn't wanna just try and answer one, but we have saved them and we're hoping that the panelists can follow up um, with you, except for if it says anonymous, we don't know who you are, um, but to try and answer these. Um, and, and thank you to the panelists for going through and talking about this. I think, of course, maybe it's still a little confusing about why make data count, why do we care about this? But as Stephanie points out, you know, as we're trying to get to this point, everyone wants research assessment. We all care about data now, but we can't, this is a hump. And so it actually requires, and with everything around data infrastructure, data is not a silo. So that's why we wanted to have this conversation that it's actually just, we need to figure out this infrastructure for everything. And it happens to be something that Stephanie's team really found while doing this research around make data count. Um, and so please keep following around this because I think there's, especially the panelists here have a lot <laughs> that they wanna build up on this. Um, and so we're really excited to see where that goes having stemmed from this and moving forward. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen and pass it over to Matt to announce the last webinar. Yeah, and I, I think also just to to add a final comment around that, you know, th there's some some work for us as as the community. Um, you know, we know that we've heard that we want to do it in an open way, and um, we want to do it upstream. Um, it must be useful for everyone, and um, we need to protect the interests of the community. And so, um, doing this together is really really important. Um, it's been really great to hear from the panelists, um, the different perspectives, um, and we're continuing um, on, on the theme and uh, um, the next webinar uh, will be posted uh, in the chat. 
Um, I think Paul, if you can um, post that, um, the link. Um, so building on from where, where we are here um, is to talk about beginning um, and using metadata um, or metadata for meaningful data. And so um, a lot of work that we need to do together. Um, if it was easy, we wouldn't all be here today. Um, and so um, we really thank you all for joining. Um, apologies that we couldn't get to all the questions. There were some really great questions and we will share those with the panelists and uh, try try get back to anyone that did, did put in comments as well. Um, just to confirm, has the link for the next uh, webinar been posted in the chat? Yes, okay. it has. And we will, um, you'll see, you know, we didn't have fun photos of speakers. It's a little farther away. It's um, in May and sorry for not showing the chat. We can put that date in there. It's in May and it's kind of the third hump that we wanted to get to, which is, well, you know, another thing Stephanie's team found, first of all, there weren't subjects in data sites. So how are we going to even figure out what discipline these data sets are from? And then this, you know, this last one is going to be about what metadata can repositories, publishers, everyone who's contributing in the metadata world, what is required for us to actually build out and understand and start to do these studies to understand research data reuse um, and potential assessment. So um, speakers to be announced soon, please follow along. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, we'll take a second to save all the chat and everything. Um, please get in touch if you have any questions. And thank you again to our panelists. This was an excellent discussion. We appreciate all of you.